Direct current circuit. What is DC? DC current or direct current is when electrons only flow in one direction. For example, if we have a battery and we'll connect it to ground and this is the negative side and there's a the positive side and we have say a light bulb there's too many electrons on the negative side of the battery and there's not enough electrons effectively on the positive side of the battery so these electrons are going to attempt to find their way to the positive side so which way can they go they're going to take the path of least resistance through the light bulb and to the positive side of the battery at this ba light bulb electrons will only be flowing in one direction it'll last as long as this battery has power but as soon as the power goes dead and this is essentially the circuit of a two cell flashlight here's 1.5 D cell and here's a 1.5 volt D cell and when these go dead the flash the light won't work anymore now light bulbs are not sensitive to which direction current flows but if we measured it coming out of this battery it would only flow in one direction DC current sine wave okay you need DFM means draw from memory so let's just put this out here and this is going to be time and this is going to be amps and when you turn it on it's going to level off and it's going to stay there for a long long time and with any luck this is perfectly parallel or constant and then at some point you're going to turn the circuit off that didn't look quite as good as I wanted it to again there we go okay this is the part you have to be able to draw from the test on the test because I want you to be able to understand the concept then in a DC circuit how many amps are flowing through the circuit are effectively unchanged once you've turned the thing on so here I'm gonna put in red things you don't have to draw on the test but this is the point right here is where you turn the switch on and this is the point right here where you turn the switch off and this point right here to this point right here that's the vast majority we're going to say that that is 99.9 percent .9 of the time effectively you're going to flip the switch and this distance right here this time right here may be about a thousandth of a second and this distance right here to right here this might be one thousandth of a second too but that's negligible to compare to this amount of time here which could be hours on end if you turn on landing light or taxi light when you go flying it might be on you're flying near the airport you leave it on for collision avoidance purposes it's on for two hours compared to a thousandth of a second on either end that's almost all the time and that's why I've got this 99.9 percent .9%. so you notice it's not changing if we had a circuit draw another one here probably get tired of me drawing circuits at some point here's a battery and here's our light bulb again electrons are going to leave the battery and go through the light bulb and back to the positive side of the battery and once we flip a switch let's say we have a single pull single throw switch in here and we close that switch we close the switch amp comes up and stays steady because the voltage of the battery is reasonably steady so E equals I times R the resistance of the light bulb is steady or constant and the battery is reasonably constant we'll talk more about how batteries change voltage as you discharge them but it doesn't change very much so if we have a constant voltage and we have a constant resistance guess what we're gonna have a constant amperage the only way you can change this amperage here I guess there's two ways is to either change the resistance of the circuit or to change the volts that are pushing the amps but the vast majority of the time we're not just gonna have a battery we're gonna hook up in an airplane we're gonna hook up an electrical generator to the circuit to keep the battery charged and to provide the amps through the light bulb and if this is set at a constant say 27 to 28 volts then this E is going to be absolutely positively accurately constant and so is the resistance and so therefore the current is going to be very very constant as well frequency of a DC circuit sense 
as I drew the height the height of our amps is constant that means it's not changing how many times per second is it changing that would be zero so the frequency of a DC circuit is zero because we're not going to worry about this point zero 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 one percent of the time here and we're not going to worry about this point zero 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 one percent of the time right here we're just going to be worrying about this ninety nine percent point nine percent of the time you could even put lots of nines you could put a line across it the vast vast majority of the time it's not changing so the frequency of a DC circuit is zero where are you gonna find aircraft or what type of aircraft are gonna have DC power systems that is most of the things on the airplane are run off of direct current and in airplanes that direct current is either gonna be a 12 or 14 volt system or it's going to be a 24 slash 28 volt system. We'll talk about that here shortly. Um, you're going to find them on, if it's got a piston engine in it, whether it's diesel or gasoline, if it's got a piston engine in it, even if it's a big piston engine, say on a 1950s transport category piston powered radial engine propeller, runs on gasoline engine, it's going to have DC generators, DC starters, and DC batteries. Also, the same goes for whether it's a, if it's a reciprocating or piston engine helicopter, whether it's a big piston powered helicopter, they don't make big piston powered helicopters anymore or a small one it's going to have DC generator on it and it's going to have DC batteries and pretty much everything the vast majority of everything on the airplane is going to run off of direct current that 12 slash 14 or that 24 slash 28 small turbine helicopters small turboprops and small business jets use DC starter generators to start them up so you need a big honking DC battery to provide power to this DC starter slash generator and so since you already have this power system available you're already going to have to develop a lot of DC power to recharge the battery they figured let's save weight let's not make a bunch of alternating current stuff let's just leave it DC since we have all these components on the airplane or helicopter that are already DC so these right here have turbine engines on it and of course these have recips reciprocating but there's five different types of aircraft that you might find out there you will find out there that use DC to power most of the components on the aircraft okay more components circuit breaker sometimes abbreviated circuit breaker and that's not the same as citizens band radio that's a big negatory good buddy okay why do we have it on the aircraft and it's there to protect wires. This is a very interesting misconception that a lot of people have, and it's even been written down, that circuit breakers are there to protect the component. They're not. The size of circuit breakers are determined by the size of the wire, not even by how many amps are going through it, because they're, it's there to protect the wire from getting too hot and melting insulation and having wires touch wires that aren't supposed to, or wires get so hot that they cause things to catch on fire. How does it work? What's its function? It opens a circuit if too many amps go through it. Essentially, the circuit breaker is just a single pull, single throw switch that operates from too many amps going through it so you don't have to worry about it. There's effectively three kinds. Um, let's see, let's draw the first kind. Here's the kind in a 172. You don't have to identify it by 172. Here's what we've got in our Seminoles. It's got a T on it. If it doesn't have the T, that means you can't pull it out. In fact, I'll show you a picture here of what it looks like. I'll come back to this. Dun, 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 dun. Here we go. Here's a Cessna 172. These you can see the white, but they're not really sticking out enough that you can pull them. And the T type right there. Here's that type. In fact, you can even see, here's a nice picture of somebody who's actually pulled the circuit breaker out. So you can think of this collar as being a T, and you can grab it. And then the third kind looks like this. This third kind right here, this one's really a switch and a circuit breaker and it's designed so that you it'll pop it'll open the circuit if too many amps go through it and you can manually operate it I got a picture here 
of one and there it is we'll get rid of this stuff and here it is this is a circuit breaker it's just like these other circuit breakers but you can operate it as a switch and if too many amps try to go through it essentially it's a single pole single throw switch and there if too many amps go through it it'll open and depending on which type this switch will actually flop back over now let's say you look at a circuit breaker and you see that it says 10 inside of it. There's a rule of thumb, and we're pilots, we love rules of thumb. If we take that 10 and multiply it by 0.7, we get 7 amps. That's the approximate. That's the approximate how many amps is going through the wire that this is protecting when the maximum amount of normal amps are going through it. So if this is the landing light, then it's very likely that this is pulling 7 amps while it's operating. Uh, let's take a uh, let's take the flat motor. Let's just say for fun that we have a 15 amp circuit breaker for the flats. Well if we multiply that by 0 0.7 see 7 and half of that would be 3.5 so we'd have 10.5 amps. Let's see if I did that right. It's about right. 7 and three and a half okay so ten and a half amps but it's only using this ten and a half amps when the flaps are operating so we don't have to worry about an amp draw from the flaps because it's not operating all the time if we left our landing light on for any period of time then we'd have to worry about it now there is a second part to this a third part to this rule of thumb uh, the first part is take the circuit breaker number and multiply it by 0.7 and that's the approximate how many amps you'll get if at its maximum if it's running all the time and of course the second part is some components we may multiply it by 0.7 to get 10 and a half amps but it's only using it very intermittently intermittently and yeah there's two T's right there we're only using it intermittently but here let's take another example and we'll just say that it's 10. And let's say that this is our COM nav radio. Well, remember, this 10 is based on the maximum amount of amps that it's no using normally. But if you got a COM radio, that means that it's only going to use about 7 amps when you're transmitting. And so it's not going to be using that 7 amps all the time. In that case, multiply it by 0.3 and it's probably using three amps to just navigate and to just listen on the comm radio and when you push in the transmit button then it'll take the seven so in this case you gotta work consider is it transmitting is it using all of that power all of the time even though you've got it turned on for a comm nav radio the answer is no in that case when it's transmitting it's 0.7 but the rest of the time it's only uh, thirty percent or multiply the, the circuit breaker by 0.3 and there's some problems in the homework you can try out and see if you fi can figure that out. Here is a picture of a circuit breaker from a home. This is the circuit breaker that goes up and down. Um, but you probably aren't going to worry too much about circuit breakers in houses. Here's the collared type of circuit breaker with it's got a T on it and that T is essentially letting you know you can grab it and you can pull it out. We have this type of circuit breaker in our PA44s and I already showed you the picture of a uh, switch type circuit breaker that not only will it pop if too many amps go through it you can also turn it off it yourself just like a switch and then of course this kind of circuit breaker that we tend to have in our 172's this kind you can't pull them out it won't let you pull them out I guess Cessna thinks you're not smart enough to know when you can pull out circuit breakers fuses here is the symbol for a fuse. It looks like an alternating current sine wave. You'll notice that the purpose and function are identical to that of a circuit breaker, but how it works is a little bit differently. You notice here, in this case, here's a fuse, and there's this metal uh, wire going through it, and it's made of a particular type of metal that melts reasonably at, at a reasonably cool temperature, hot, you know, like four or 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and the diameter of it is a particular diameter so when a certain number of amps go through it it'll melt in the middle and then there'll be a gap between here and that opens the circuit 
course with fuses now you can't just reset it by pushing it back in you have to pull it out and put in another one here's an automotive fuse and you see this little U shape right in here that's the part that would melt this part right in here would be missing if you pull this out of your car you'd see that this particular wire in here is a certain diameter made out of a certain kind of metal and that's the part that melts if too many amps go through it effectively opening the circuit so the purpose and function of a fuse are the same the diagram the uh, symbol rather is different and of course you gotta replace it manually and so there's not a lot of fuses for pilots to replace on newer airplanes SPDT single pole single throw Whoops, sorry, single pull double throw. Since the D here. Single pull, okay, so we've got one pole in here flopping around, but double throw. That means it can throw electrons into two different circuits. So this uh, pole here can go up or down and allow electrons to go this direction or allow the electrons to go that direction. That part right there in black is what you have to draw for the test. The most likely time, for instance, on a 172 it's going to be used for a flap motor. This is essentially going to be the flap switch and if we flip this up then the motor will spin one direction and the flaps will go up. If we push the switch in the opposite direction it'll make the motor spin in the opposite direction and the flaps will go in the opposite direction. So why do we have it on the aircraft so we can make something go forward or reverse? We could also include up or down and how does it do its job? Uh, by sending electrons to one of two different circuits. So I got a couple of pictures here. Here is a single pole double throw switch and here's that one coming in and it can either send electrons to that pole or it can send them to that one. Here's another one. Here's a landing gear switch and again electrons are coming in you can flop it over to that one or you can flop it over to that one and of course here's a flap switch looks like out of uh, I don't know what this gives me over here is that looks like a fuel selector valve but this certainly flap switch sure looks like out of a 172 so you can either make the electrons go in one direction or make the electrons go in the other or there's that neutral position where it's not connected so it's a three position switch wow it's kind of like a uh, selector valve that has forward reverse and on in fact it's extremely similar in uh, principle to a three-way selector valve. You can turn it off, you can make things go in one direction, or you can make things go in the opposite direction. Diode. Here is the electrical symbol for a diode. It's a triangle filled in, pointed in in one direction, and up against that triangle is a line now when they first figured out diodes they still thought electrons were positive and went from positive to negative and then they figured out that electrons were negative but they didn't change the direction of the diode so electron flow is actually opposite to the direction of this main big fat arrow so on the test if I ask you to draw this symbol by the way on the test you need to be able to draw all of the symbols that I'm showing you and be able to say what the purpose is and what the function is and in the case of the diode I'll say draw the I could say draw the diagram of the symbol uh, the schematic symbol for a diode and draw an arrow to show electron flow. Why do we have it on board the aircraft? Well, a couple of major purposes: protect circuits. That is, it won't let electrons go in the wrong direction. And there's a second reason is that, and I'll show that to you in a later section, is you can change alternating current into direct current by putting enough diodes in there and only letting electrons flow in one direction. You can change the alternating current into direct current. The function, or how does it get its job done? It does it by only allowing current flow in one direction. You'll notice that the function here, not the purpose, but the function here is extremely similar to that of a check valve from a hydraulic system. Here's a picture of a diode. If you see that silver on there, you don't have to remember it for the test, but if you see the silver band, that's the side that's got the black line on it. Here's another diode, big silver looking one. And here's six diodes inside of a uh, an alternator. Let's see, one, two, 
the third one must be under there. Here's one, two, three. And this is actually the rectifier. This is the part in an alternator that converts the alternating current being produced in it. And it goes through the diodes and comes out direct current. And we'll talk more about that when we get to alternators. A relay. A relay, its reason for being on the aircraft is to save weight. I'll show you how. Let's just say, for instance, that, uh, well, I'll give you the classic example here. Here's our 28 volt DC bus in a 172. And let's say we had a, uh, a battery hooked up to it. And we want to run the starter motor. Well, the starter motor takes a lot of electrical power. If we had to run a wire from the bus all the way into the cockpit and have a single pole single throw switch and run that wire all the way back to the engine compartment the motor takes a lot of amps so we need a big wire if we need this big wire it's going to take up a lot of weight all the way here and all the way there so instead of having a big wire we're going to use a relay And let's see if I can figure this out. Oh yeah, here we go. So here, now we're going to put a metal plate right there. And a coil. And we can run this all the way over here. That's a ground. And here's our single pull, single throw switch. And this is in the cockpit. And this relay which I'll circle here in red. You don't have to circle it in red on the test. Or I'll just draw the relay. Here's what a relay looks like. Two contacts with a wire, a metal plate on top, and a coil underneath it. When we close this switch, that's going to allow ground to be connected to one side of this coil, and you'll notice the other side of the coil is connected to the bus bar, and the bus bar is connected to positive. So electrons can leave the battery, go through the ground, go through the ground, go through the switch, go through the coil, go through the wire, through the bus bar, into the positive side of the battery. And so now this coil is going to have lines of flux. So if we get lines of flux now, it's going to pull this metal plate down, and it's going to make an electrical contact. And now it's going to allow current flow from the negative side of the battery through the motor. There's a bunch of wires in the motor through the contact bus bar and to the positive side of the battery and now we only have to have this one short big wire because this uh, relay right here this coil doesn't have to be very strong so this wire doesn't need very many amps going through it so it can be really small and therefore not weigh very much this is also very common in fact always not just common if we have our, let's say it's a 14 volt DC bus, and we'll say that this is for, uh, say, a Seminole, for instance. So there's, here's our relay right here. This is going to be the electrical master switch. We turn this switch on, we close the circuit, and the negative side of the battery is connected here. So the coil is connected to negative, and the opposite side of the coil is connected to positive. So we get our lines of flux, and that pulls the metal plate down and because it's made out of iron, soft iron, doesn't retain any magnetism and so now the positive side of the battery is connected to the bus bar and so that's what's going to happen on whether it's a PA44 or a Cessna 172 or any other airplane you get in that electrical master switch is actually 
energizing this relay and the relay is connecting the battery so this wire right here which have to be really big because lots of amps have to go through it we can leave this these wires we can keep these short we can keep these wires short save weight because this wire here is really small because of low amps going through it it can be a very small cross-sectional area so you're gonna see relays all over the place and you'll notice how does it do its job by remotely long distance away and electrically uh, using an electromagnet to open and close a circuit it's really just a remotely and ele an electrically operated single pole single throw switch it's just we want to save weight by not having to run the big wires all over the airplane here's a picture of a relay here you can see this electromagnet here's the coil of wire and here's this metal plate it gets pulled down and there's a spring pulling it back up so uh, relays are spring loaded generally speaking to the off position so when you energize it one side's going to go to positive and the other side of this coil through some kind of a switch typically is going to go to negative so that when it's energized it pulls the metal plate down and you can't see it very well but there's two connectors in there two yeah two connect two contacts in there here's another relay essentially let's use it Bit better color here. Uh, here's the contact going out those big two. So and then it doesn't show you, but here's the electromagnet in there. Again, one's going to go to a switch and to ground, and the other is going to go essentially to the, the the battery. So now we connect it. The metal plate comes down, makes a connection, and electrons can go through the relay and that's what a relay is going to look like on a Cessna 172 or a Piper 7 ohm. and here's another relay it's all in there the same parts we've been looking at before but it's a nice cube looking thing there are a lot of small relays in airplanes that don't use a lot of power use as much power as a starter relay but some of them look like that shunt purpose of a shunt is to save weight and how does it do it by allowing some of the amps to go through it instead of going through a wire okay Let's give the classic example. On a PA44, for instance, the uh, alternators are way out in the engine compartments, and if we had to run a big old honking wire all the way to the cockpit and then all the way back to the alternators so you could see how many amps uh, the alternators producing, those wires would take up a lot of weight, and we want to save weight. So what we're going to do is we're going to, let's see, we're going to, we got this bus bar, and you don't have to draw the symbol for a generator yet, but you will. So a generator or alternator looks like this. And this wire right here has a lot of power going through it, so it's going to be really, really big. Now the cockpit, let's just say the cockpit's way over here, and we have, for instance, an ammeter. So we're going to hook this ammeter up but if we had the wire going all the way to the cockpit to the ammeter and then all the way back then the weight of these wires here would be big because we'd be talking a piece of copper is big around as your middle finger I mean your uh, pinky finger so we don't want to we want these wires to be small and of course therefore lightweight so what we're going to do is we're going to put in a shunt and I'm not going to ask you to draw a picture of a shunt. Now what's going to happen is is that this this part right here is going to have very very low resistance and I'm making these numbers up but we'll just say 0.1 ohm of resistance is from this dot to this dot because there's a piece of wire in here that's an exact perfect 0 .0, 0 0 0 ohms and we'll say that the ammeter and the wires, all of this combined, is say 100 ohms of resistance. So now we have a ratio. The, light, the electrons are going to be coming down in here, and they're going to have a choice. Does it go through this one little wire that's 0.1 ohms of resistance, or do some of them go through the wire, through the ammeter, 
and back, and then all of them continue into the generator. Well, a few of them will, and they're going to do it at the ratio of the resistance, or actually at the inverse of the ratio. The ratio of 0.1 to 100 equals 1 over 1,000. So effectively, one electron is going to go through the, through the ammeter and through the wires for every 1,000 amps or electrons that go through this little calibrated wire of 0.1. So that means that if only one amp, for instance, if we use the ratios of amps, if only one amp goes through here, then this wire can be really small and really lightweight, and so can this other one. And we can leave these big heavy wires in the engine compartment, and they can be nice and short. So that's how it saves weight. And you're going to see, as soon as you stop having a single engine airplane, you're going to have a shunt for the ammeter. And uh, there's some single engine airplanes that use this as well. So how does it do its job? What's its function? By allowing some of the amps to go through it instead of all going through correction. Allow some of the, the amps, just a few of them, to go through the wire and the ammeter, but most of them still go through the generator slash alternator. And here's a picture of a shunt. You can see this calibrated wire. Here, this is a shunt that's a lot of amps through. It looks like there's actually three or four piece flat pieces of metal. So that's a very calibrated resistance. And of course, I made that number up. But it would be like 0 0.10000 ohms. So it would be very accurately done. So our gauge would read very accurately. And here's a close up of another shunt. And you can see this wire between it. A bus tie. Here, I got a picture. There's the bus tie. Nope. Sorry, you don't have to draw the symbol because bus ties can be uh, different components like a single pull, single throw switch, a circuit breaker, or a fuse. Let's say you have the main 28 volts DC main bus that you run almost everything off of. And next to it, though, you have a bus that you run the radios on the avionics bus. You've probably all operated this bus tie in a Cessna 172 or a Seminole. That way you can turn off all, all the avionics on and, on and off at the same time and it's generally thought of in, in aviation that if you turn the, open this up when you turn off the alternators or turn on the alternators if there's any uh, voltages that get too high or too low it won't hurt the avionics. So this is very very common to see bus ties and its purpose, what, how, why is it in the aircraft? It'll uh, allow or stop electron flowing between the bus bars, and how does it do it? It essentially makes an electrical connection between two bus bars. And generally, I've seen switches, I've seen circuit breakers, and I've seen fuses as the bus tie. And one more shot of the bus tie. So you don't have to draw on the test. There's no symbol draw for this since it could be you already know how to draw those symbols. Hey, the hot battery bus. Hot battery bus. Uh, on a Cessna 172 and probably also a Seminole, that hot battery bus is going to be used for two things. To run the digital clock and to run the hour meter or the Hobbs meter. Um, if we've got our main bus bar We'll say 14 volt DC, and that's our main bus. We're, there's going to be some other bus, and that's going to be the hot battery bus. <coughs> Excuse me. And down here we're going to have a battery. And of course we're going to have a relay with the electrical master switch. And if we open the electrical master switch, this switch is drawn in the open or incomplete or off uh, position. This metal plate is going to be higher. It's not going to be making a connection. So nothing connected to the bus bar will work. We can have a light bulb. We can have a motor. And none of these things will work, which works out. And, especially, and if we even left the avionics master on 
a power couldn't get to it because the positive side of the battery still isn't connected to it. However, there's some things we want connected to the battery all the time, even when we turn the electrical master switch off or open it. And that's generally speaking the clock. So it doesn't so we don't have to reset it every flight. And the hour meter. Now the hour meter is hooked into the uh, an oil pressure switch on the engine. So there's a, a, an oil pressure switch. Let's try that again. There we go. There's an oil pressure switch on the engine. So if the oil engine's not running, this switch will open and the hour meter won't run. So it's not draining the battery. But this bus bar is hot or connected to the positive side of the battery all the time and you cannot disconnect that as the pilot. So why is it on board the aircraft? So we can keep some stuff turned on even when you turn the master off and how does it do it? By keeping them powered all times. Voltmeter, boy this is one of those very very difficult um, electrical schematic symbols to remember it's a, a circle with a V in it uh, that's a voltmeter let's say that we have and I'll leave out the relay and stuff here there's our battery let's put a voltmeter in the circuit and let's just say oops, that this electric motor right there is the turn coordinator and we leave strobe lights on and we leave the avionics bus connected we're going to slowly drain the battery we'll get to it here in another section but the voltmeter if it's uh, say whoops let's say that it's a uh, keep pushing that button one more time voltmeter let's say it's a 28 volt DC bus the battery will start out at 25.2 volts and as the battery discharges it's going to go down just a few volts and by the time it gets down to 22 volts it's going to be dead. Um, another thing that we might like to use with, uh, voltmeters are good for is to tell us how well the generator or alternator is working. If we're in a 28 volt DC system that voltmeter when the generator is running it should be up here reading 27 to 28. If we look over at the voltmeter and the voltmeter has come down near 25, that means that the generator or the alternator is not working very well. So voltmeters are very handy to give the pilot an indication of system oper system condition. You'll notice that this purpose is the same as an ammeter and the same as the pressure gauge in a hydraulic system. In fact, a voltmeter is really uh, just measuring electrical pressure so it's essentially identical to that of a pressure gauge in a hydraulic system. It's there to give the pilot an indication of the system. Now how it does it, what's its function, is it displays the pressure of electrons instead of displaying hydraulic pressure. It's displaying pressure of electrons and we'll talk some more about voltmeters on another occasion. Here is a voltmeter. Uh, what I find interesting about this is they did a really good job and you'll notice they've got the red coming in right around 11. Well, if we looked at, at 27 to 28, if the generator was working, and 25.2 if the battery was fully charged, and it'd be dead at 22, if we divided all of those numbers by 2, here we'd get 11 volts. Sure enough, they've got the top end of the red arc at 11 volts. That essentially means that uh, here'd be 12.6. As the voltage goes down towards that 11 volts, the battery's going to be dead by the time you get to 11 volts. And here's one. I like this one. Here's one you can buy. And this one works, I think it was 10 volts to 30 volts. And you can plug it into the cigarette lighter of the aircraft, whether it's a 12 volt or a 24 volt system. And it gives you a digital readout of the voltage. Of course, this is reading 13.8, which is about a good voltage, 13. 0.5 to 14 volts is what you would generally read if the generator or alternator were working in an airplane that had a 12 or a 14 volt system. You don't have to write those numbers down right now. I'll be reminding you later. 
Okay, complex DC system schematic. I recommend that you pause the video right now and draw this schematic in. And when you get that schematic drawn, hit unpause and start taking some more notes. Okay, in a uh, previous chapter, we identified a whole lot of stuff. Like this wire right here was a conductor. And we have a ground. And of course, a battery. And a bus bar. And a single pole, single throw switch. And in this case, we don't have an ammeter or a variable resistor coil. Or, oh, wait, we do have a motor. So there are some things in this schematic that we've already looked at. But there's also, and that's the fun this time, is the things that we haven't looked at. For instance, right here, we've got the hot battery bus. You'll notice that it is connected to the positive side of the battery all the time, hence the term hot. We also have a relay. Now you don't have to put this dotted line in, but I'm, I like it because what's inside the dotted line is what's inside of the relay. Here's our shunt. Of course, here's our ammeter. and we'll get to a DC generator alternator in another section. Here is our single pull yet double throw switch and of course we have a circuit breaker and we have a fuse and although technically this is a single pull single throw switch whoops hit the button Technically, this single pole, single throw switch, we're going to call this a bus tie because it's used to tie the avionics bus bar into the main bus bar so the avionics bus bar can get power. And then, of course, here's the diode with an arrow next to it to show what direction the electrons are flowing. Let's see if I've missed anything. Circuit breaker, fuse, single pole. Okay, so there we have it. So now we have a little bit more complicated diagram than we did before. You should be prepared on the next test to, uh, if you're shown a diagram with these types of components in it, that you could label them all and say what the purpose is and what the function of each of the components are. Of course, a bus tie it doesn't have to be single pole, single throw switch. It could be a circuit breaker or a, or a fuse as well. If you have any questions about this section, you know how to get a hold of me. Any improvements, let me know as well. Thanks. Bye.